Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Storm Lights of Anzaska by Lee Ritchie, published in 1835. It is a tragic romance that takes place in the wild Italian Alps with, of course, a hint of a ghost story. A quick note before we begin that this is a famous gold mining region, and the gold miners are called Minerali. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. These lights are wholly different both in appearance and situation from the Ignis Fatus. The main road from the Lago Maggiore to the western parts of Switzerland at one time ran through the valley of Anzaska, and it was once my fortune to be detained all night at a cottage in one of its wildest defiles by a storm which rendered my horses ungovernable. While leaning upon a bench and looking with a drowsy curiosity towards the window, for there was no bed except my host's, of which I did not choose to deprive him, I saw a small faint light among the rocks in the distance. I had first conceived that it might proceed from a cottage window, but, remembering that that part of the mountain was wholly uninhabited, and indeed uninhabitable, I roused myself, and, calling one of the family, inquired what it meant. While I spoke, the light suddenly vanished, but in about a minute reappeared in another place, as if the bearer had gone round some intervening rock. The storm at that time raged with the fury which threatened to blow our hut with its men and horses over the mountains, and the night was so intensely dark that the edges of the horizon were wholly indistinguishable from the sky. There it is again, said I. What is that in the name of God? It is Lelia's lamp, cried the young man eagerly, who was a son of our host. Awake, father. Ho, Batista, Vittorio, Lelia is on the mountains. At these cries, the whole family sprung up from their lair at once, and, crowding round the window, fixed their eyes upon the light, which continued to appear, although at long intervals, for a considerable part of the night. When interrogated as to the nature of this mystic lamp, the cottagers made no scruple of telling me all they knew, on the sole condition that I should be silent when it appeared, and leave them to mark uninterruptedly the spot when it rested. To render my story intelligible, it is necessary to say that the minerali and farmers form two distinct classes in the valley of Ansaska. The occupation of the former, when pursued as a profession, is reckoned disreputable by the other inhabitants, who obtain their living by regular industry. And indeed, the manners of the minerali offer some excuse for what might otherwise be reckoned an illiberal prejudice. They are addicted to drinking, quarrelsome, overbearing, at one moment rich and at another starving, and in short they are subject to all the calamities, both moral and physical, which beset men who can have no dependence on the product of their labor, ranking in this respect with gamesters, authors, and other vagabonds. They are, notwithstanding, a fine race of men, brave, hardy, and often handsome. They spend freely what they win lightly, and if one day they sleep off their hunger, lying like wild animals basking in the sun, the next, if fortune has been propitious, they swagger about, gallant and gay, the lords of the valley. Like the sons of God, the minerali sometimes make love to the daughters of men, and, although they seldom possess the hand, they occasionally touch the heart of the gentle maidens of Anzaska. If their wooing is unsuccessful, there are comrades still wilder than their own, whose arms are always open to receive the desperate and the brave. They change the scene and betake themselves to the highways when nights are dark and travelers unwary, or they enlist under the banners of those regular banditti who rob in the thousands and whose booty is a province or a kingdom. Francesco Martelli was the handsomest gold seeker in the valley. He was wild, it is true, but that was the badge of his tribe, and he made up for this by so many good qualities that the farmers themselves, at least such of them as had not marriageable daughters, delighted in his company. Francesco could sing ballads so sweetly and mournfully that the old dames leant back in the chimney corner to weep while he sung. He had that deep and melancholy voice which, 
when once heard, lingers in the ear, and when heard again, however unexpectedly, seems like a longing realized. There was only one young lass in the valley who had never heard the songs of Francesco. All the others, seen or unseen, on some pretext or other, had gratified their curiosity. The exception was Lilia, the daughter of one of the richest farmers in Anzaska. Lilia was very young, being scarcely sixteen, but in her quality of an only daughter, with a dowry in expectancy equal to more than one thousand Austrian livres, she attracted considerable observation. Her face, on minute inspection, was beautiful to absolute perfection, but her figure, although symmetrical, was so petite, and her manner so shy and girlish, that she was thought of more as a child than a young woman. The heiress of old Nicoli was the designation made use of, when parents would endeavor to awaken the ambition of their sons, as they looked forward to what might be some years hence. But Lilia, in her own person, was a non-entity. Her mother had died in giving her birth, and, for many a year, the life of the child had been preserved, or rather, her death prevented, by what seemed a miracle. Even after the disease, whatever it might have been, had yielded to the sleepless care of her father, she remained in that state which is described by the expression not unwell, rather than in perfect health, although the most troublesome memento that remained of her illness was nothing more than a nervous timidity, which, in a more civilized part of the country, might have passed for delicacy of feeling. Besides being in some degree shut out from the society of her equals by this peculiarity of her situation, she was prevented from enjoying it by another. While her body languished, the cultivation of her mind had advanced. Music, to which she was passionately attached, paved the way for poetry, and poetry, in spite of the doctrines of a certain school you have in England, unfitted her for association with the ignorant and unrefined. That Lilia, therefore, had never sought to hear the ballads of Francesco was occasioned, it may readily be believed, by nothing more than an instinctive terror, mingled with the dislike with which the name of one of the ruffian minerali inspired her, and, in truth, she listened to the tales that from time to time reached her ear of the young gold-seeker, with somewhat of the vague and distant interest with which we attend to descriptions of a beautiful but wild and cruel animal of another hemisphere. There came one at last, however, to whom poor Lilia listened. She was sitting alone, according to her usual custom, at the bottom of her father's garden, singing while she plied her knitting needle in the soft, low tone peculiar to her voice and beyond which it had no compass. The only fence at the garden at this place was a belt of shrubs which encircled the border of the deep ravine it overlooked. At the bottom of this ravine flowed the river, rapid and yet sullen, and beyond, scarcely distant two hundred yards, a range of precipitous cliffs shut in the horizon. The wild and desolate aspect of the scene was overshadowed and controlled, as it were, by the stern grandeur of these ramparts of nature and the whole contributed to form such a picture as artists travel a thousand miles to contemplate. Lilia, however, had looked upon it from childhood. It had never been forced upon her imagination by contrast, for she had never travelled five miles from her father's house, and she continued to knit and sing and dream without even raising her eyes. Her voice was rarely loud enough to be caught by the echoes of the opposite rocks, although sometimes it did happen that, carried away by enthusiasm, she produced a tone which was repeated by the fairy minstrels of the glen. On the present occasion she listened with surprise to a similar effect, for her voice had died almost in a whisper. She sang another stanza in a louder key. The challenge was accepted, and a rich, sweet voice took up the strain of her favorite ballad where she had dropped it. Lilia's first impulse was to fly, her second to sit still and watch for a renewal of the music, and her third, which she obeyed, was to steal on tiptoe to the edge of the ravine and look down into the abyss from whence the voice seemed to proceed. The echo, she discovered, was a young man engaged in navigating a raft down the river, 
such as is used by the peasantry of the Alps to float themselves and their wares to market, and which, at the moment, was stranded on the shore at the foot of the garden. He leant upon an oar, as if in the act of pushing off his clumsy boat, but his face was upturned like one watching for the appearance of a star, and Lilia felt a sudden conviction, she knew not why, that he had seen her through the trees while she sat singing, and had adopted this method of attracting her attention without alarming her. If such had been his purpose, he seemed to have no ulterior view, for, after gazing for an instant, he withdrew his eyes in confusion, and, pushing off the raft, dropped rapidly down the river, and was soon out of sight. Lilia's life was as calm as a sleeping babe, which a cloud will blacken and the wing of an insect disturb. Even this little incident was matter for thought, and entered into the soft reveries of sixteen. She felt her cheeks tingle as she wondered how long the young man had gazed at her through the trees, and why he had floated away without speaking when he had succeeded in attracting her attention. There was delicacy in his little contrivance to save her the surprise, perhaps the terror, of seeing a stranger in such a situation. There was modesty in the confusion with which he had turned away his head, and what perhaps was as valuable as either, even to the gentle Lilia, there was admiration, deep and devout, in those brilliant eyes that had quailed beneath hers. The youth was as beautiful as a dream, and his voice, it was so clear and yet so soft, so powerful and yet so melodious. It haunted her ear like a prediction. It was a week before she again saw this Apollo of her girlish imagination. It seemed as if, in the interval, they had had time to get acquainted. They exchanged salutations, the next time they spoke, and the next time they conversed. There was nothing mysterious in their communications. He was probably a farmer's son of the upper valley, who had been attracted, like others, by the fame of the heiress of old Nicolay. He, indeed, knew nothing of books, and he loved poetry more for the sake of music than its own. But what of that? The writings of God were around and within them, and these, if they did not understand, they at least felt. He was bold and vigorous of mind, and this is beauty to the fair and the timid. He skimmed along the edge of the precipice and sprung from rock to rock in the torrent as fearless as the chamois. He was beautiful and brave and proud, and this glorious creature, with radiant eyes and glowing cheeks, laid himself down at her feet to gaze upon her face as poets worship the moon. The world, before so monotonous, so blank, so drear, was now a heaven to poor Lilia. One thing only perplexed her. They were sufficiently long, according to the calculations of sixteen, and sufficiently well acquainted. Their sentiments had been avowed without disguise, their faith plighted beyond recall, and as yet her lover had never mentioned his name. Lilia, reflecting on this circumstance, condemned for the moment her precipitation, but there was now no help for it, and she could only resolve to extort the secret, if secret it was, at the next meeting. "'My name,' said the lover, in reply to her frank and sudden question, "'you will know it soon enough.' "'But I will not be said nay. You must tell me now, or at all events tomorrow night.' "'Why tomorrow night?' Because a young, rich, and handsome suitor, on whom my father's heart is set, is then to propose, in proper form, for this poor hand, and, let the confession cost what it may, I will not overthrow the dearest plans of my only parent without giving a reason which will satisfy even him. Oh, you do not know him. Wealth weighs as nothing in the scale against his daughter's happiness. You may be poor, for aught I know, but you are good and honorable, and, therefore, in his eyes, no unfitting match for Lilia. It was almost dark, but Lilia thought she perceived a smile on her lover's face while she spoke, and a gay suspicion flashed through her mind, which made her heart beat and her cheeks tingle. He did not answer for many minutes. A struggle of some kind seemed to agitate him, 
But at length, in a suppressed voice, he said, Tomorrow night, then. Here? No, in your father's house, in the presence of my rival. The morrow night arrived with a ceremonious formality practiced on such occasions in the valley. The lover of whom Lelia had spoken was presented to his mistress to ask permission to pay his addresses, or, in other words, for there is but short shrift for an Enzoskin maid, to demand her hand in marriage. This was indeed a match on which old Nikolai had set his heart, for the offer was by far the best that could have been found from the Val de Osola to Monte Rosa. The youth was rich, well-looking, and prudent even to coldness. What more could a father desire? Lilia had put off the minute of appearing in the porch, where the elders of both families had assembled, as long as possible. While mechanically arranging her dress, she continued to gaze out of the lattice, which commanded a view of the road and of the parties below, in expectation that increased to agony. Bitter were her reflections during that interval. She was almost tempted to believe that what had passed was nothing more than a dream, a figment of her imagination, disordered by poetry and solitude, and perhaps in some measure warped by disease. Had she been made the sport of an idle moment? And was the smile she had observed on her lover's face only the herald of the laugh which perhaps at this moment testified his enjoyment of her perplexity and disappointment? His conduct presented itself in the double light of folly and ingratitude, and at length, in obedience to the repeated summons of her father, she descended to the porch with a trembling step and a fevered cheek. The sight of the company that awaited her awed and depressed her. She shrunk from them with more than morbid timidity, while their stony eyes, fixed upon her in all the rigidity of form and transmitted custom, seemed to freeze her very heart. There was one there, however, whose ideas of propriety, strict as they were, could never prevent his eyes from glistening and his arms from extending at the approach of Lilia. Her father, after holding her for a moment at arm's length, as with a doting look his eyes wandered over the bravery of her new white dress, drew her close to his bosom and blessed her. My child, said he, smiling gaily through a gathering tear. It is hard for an old man to think of parting with all he loves in the world, but the laws of nature must be respected. Young men will love, and young lasses will like, to the end of time, and new families will spring up out of their union. It is the way, girl. It is the fate of maids, and there's an end. For sixteen years have I watched over you, even like a miser watching his gold, and now, treasure of my life, I give you away. All I ask on your part is obedience, aye, and cheerful obedience, after the manner of our ancestors, and according to the laws of God. After this is over, let the old man stand aside, or pass away when it pleases heaven. He has left his child happy, and his children's children will bless his memory. He has drank of the cup of life, sweet and bitter, bitter and sweet, even to the bottom. But with honey, Lilia, thanks to his blessed darling, with honey in the dregs. Lilia fell on her father's neck and sobbed aloud. So long and bitter was her sobbing that the formality of the party was broken and the circle narrowed anxiously around her. When at last she raised her head, it was seen that her cheeks were dry and her face as white as the marble of Cordaglia. A murmur of compassion ran through the bystanders, and the words, Poor thing! Still so delicate! Old hysterics! were whisperingly repeated from one to the other. The father was alarmed, and hastened to cut short a ceremony which seemed so appalling to the nervous timidity of his daughter. It is enough, said he. All will be over in a moment. Lilia, do you accept of this young man for your suitor? Come, one little word, and it is done. Lilia tried in vain to speak, and she bowed her acquiescence. Sirs, continued Nicolai, my daughter accepts of the suitor you offer. It is enough. Salute your mistress, my son, and let us go in and pass round the cup of alliance. 
The maiden hath not answered, observed a cold, cautious voice among the relations of the suitor. Speak then, said Nicoli, casting an angry and disdainful look at the formalist. It is but a word, a sound. Speak. Lilia's dry, white lips had unclosed to obey when the gate of the little court was wrenched open by one who was apparently too much in haste to find the latch, and a man rushed into the midst of the circle. Speak not, he shouted. I forbid. Lilia sprung toward him with a stifled cry and would have thrown herself into his arms had she not been suddenly caught midway by her father. What is this? demanded he sternly, but in rising alarm. Ruffian, drunkard, madman, what would you do here? You cannot provoke me, Nicolie, said the intruder, were you to spit upon me. I come to demand your daughter in marriage. You, shouted the enraged father. You, repeated the relations in tones of wonder, scorn, rage, or ridicule, according to the temperament of the individual. It needeth no more of this said the same cold, cautious voice that had spoken before. A wedding begun in a brawl will never end in a bedding. To demand a girl in legitimate marriage is neither a sin nor a shame. Let the young man be answered even by the maiden herself, and then depart in peace. He hath spoken well, said the more cautious among the old men. Speak, daughter, answer, and let the man be gone. Lilia grew pale and then read. She made a step forward, hesitated, looked at her father timidly, and then stood still as a statue, pressing her clasped hands upon her bosom as if to silence the throbbings that disturbed her reason. Girl, said old Nicoli, in a voice of suppressed passion as he seized her by the arm, do you know that man? Did you ever see him before? Answer, can you tell me his name? No. No. The insolent ruffian. Go, girl, present your cheek to your future husband, that the customs of our ancestors may be fulfilled, and leave me to clear my doorway of vagabonds. She stepped forward mechanically, but when the legitimate suitor, extending his arms, ran forward to meet her, she eluded him with a sudden shriek and staggered toward the intruder. Hold, hold, cried the relations. You are mad. You know not what you do. It is Francesco, the Minerallo. She had reached the stranger, who did not move from where he stood, and as the ill-omened name met her ear, she fainted in his arms. The confusion that ensued was indescribable. Lilia was carried senseless into the house, and it required the efforts of half the party to hold back the father who would have grappled with the Minerallo upon the spot. Francesco stood for some time with folded arms in mournful and moody silence, but when at length the voice of cursing, which Nikolai continued to pour forth against him, had sunk in exhaustion, he advanced and confronted him. I can bear these names, said he from you. Some of them, you know well, are undeserved, and if others fit, it is more my misfortune than my fault. If to chastise insults and render back scorn for scorn is to be a ruffian, I am one, but no man can be called a vagabond who resides in the habitation and follows the trade of his ancestors. These things, however, are trifles. At best, they are only words. Your real objection to me is that I am poor. It is a strong one. If I chose to take your daughter without a dowry, I would take her in spite of you all. But I will leave her, even to that thing without a soul, rather than subject so gentle and fragile a being to the privations and vicissitudes of a life like mine. I demand, therefore, not simply your daughter, but a dowry, if only a small one, and you have the right to require that on my part I shall not be empty-handed. She is young, and, and there can be, and ought to be, no hurry with her marriage. But give me only a year, a single year, name a reasonable sum, and if by the appointed time I cannot tell the money into your hands, I hereby engage to relinquish every claim which her generous preference has given me upon your daughter's hand. 
It is well put, replied the cold and cautious voice in the assembly. A year, at any rate, would have elapsed between the present betrothing and the damsel's marriage. If the young man, before the bells of twelve, on this night twelve month, layeth down upon the table, either in coined money, or in gold, or golden ore, the same sum which we were here ready to guarantee on the part of my grandson, why I, for one, shall not object to the maiden's whim, provided it continues so long, being consulted in the disposal of her hand and preference to her father's judgment and desires. The sum is only three thousand livres. A laugh of scorn and derision arose among the relations. Yes, yes, said they. It is but just. Let the mineralo produce three thousand livres, and he shall have his bride. Neighbor Nicolai, it is a fair proposal, and allow us to intercede for Francesco and beg your assent. Sirs, said Francesco, in perplexity mingled with anger, the sum of three thousand livres. He was interrupted by another forced laugh of derision. It is a fair proposal, repeated the relations. Agree, neighbor Nicoli, agree. I agree, said Nicoli disdainfully. It is agreed, replied Francesco, in a burst of haughty indignation, and with a swelling heart he withdrew. A very remarkable change appeared to take place from that moment in the character and habits of the Mineralo. He not only deserted the company of his riotous associates, but even that of the few respectable persons to whose houses he had obtained admission, either by his talents for singing or the comparative propriety of his conduct. Day after day he labored in his precarious avocation. The changes of the seasons were not now admitted as excuses. The storm did not drive him to the wine shed, and the rain did not confine him to his hut. Day after day, and often night after night, he was to be found in the field, on the mountains, by the sides of the rain courses, on the shores of the torrent. He rarely indulged himself even in the recreation of meeting his mistress, for whom all this labor was submitted to. Gold, not as a means but as an end, seemed to be his thought by day and his dream by night, the object and end of his existence. When they did meet, in darkness and loneliness and mystery, it was but to exchange a few hurried sentences of hope and comfort and affected reliance upon fortune. On these occasions, tears and tremblings and hysterical sobbing sometimes told, on her part, at once the hollowness of her words and the weakness of her constitution. But on his all was, or seemed to be, enthusiasm and steadfast expectation. Days and weeks, however, passed by. Moons rolled away. The year was drawing to its wane, and a great part of the enormous sum was still in the womb of the mountains. Day by day, week by week, and month by month, the hopes of the Mineralo became fainter. He could no longer bestow the comfort which did not cheer even his dreams. Gloomy and sad, he could only strain his mistress in his arms without uttering a word when she ventured an inquiry respecting his progress, and then hurry away to resume, mechanically, his hopeless task. It is a strange, sometimes an awful thing, to look into the mystery of the female mind. Lilia's health had received a shock from the circumstances we have recorded, which left her cheek pale and her limbs weak for many months, and to this physical infirmity was now added the effect of those dumb but too eloquent interviews with her lover. The lower he sunk in despondency, however, and the more desperate grew their affairs, the higher her spirits rose, as if to quell and control their fortune. Her hopes seemed to grow in proportion with his fears, and the strength which deserted him went over as an ally and supporter to her weakness. Even her bodily health received its direction from her mind. Her nerves seemed to recover their tone, her cheek its hue, and her eye its brilliancy. The cold and sluggish imagination of a man is unacquainted with half the resources of a woman in such circumstances. 
Disappointed in her dependence on fortune and causality, Lelia betook herself to the altars and gods of her people. Saints and martyrs were by turns invoked, vows were offered up, and pilgrimages and religious watchings performed. Then came dreams and prodigies into play, and omens and auguries. Sorties were wrested from the pages of Dante, and warnings and commands translated from the mystic of the sky, the stars, which are the poetry of heaven. The year touched upon its close, and the sum which the gold seeker had amassed, although great almost to a miracle, was still far, very far, from sufficient. The last day of the year arrived, ushered in by a storm and thunderings and lightnings, and the evening fell cold and dark upon the despairing labors of Francesco. He was on the side of the mountain opposite Niccoli's house, and as daylight died in the valley, he saw with inexpressible bitterness of soul by the number of lights in the windows that the fate was not forgotten. Some trifling success, however, induced him, like a droning man grasping at a straw, to continue his search. He was on the spot indicated by a dream of his enthusiastic mistress, and she had conjured him not to abandon the attempt till the bell of the distant church should silence their hopes forever. His success continued. He was working with a pickaxe and had discovered a very small perpendicular vein, and it was just possible that this, although altogether inadequate in itself, might be crossed at a greater depth by a horizontal one, and thus form one of the groupi, or nests, in which the ore is plentiful and easily extracted. To work, however, was difficult, and to work long, impossible. His strength was almost exhausted. The storm beat fiercely in his face, and the darkness increased every moment. His heart wholly failed him, his limbs trembled. A cold perspiration bedewed his brow, and as the last rays of daylight departed from the mountainside, he fell senseless upon the ground. How long he remained in this state he did not know, but he was recalled to life by a sound resembling, as he imagined, a human cry. The storm howled more wildly than ever along the side of the mountain, and it was now pitch dark, but on turning round his head he saw, at a little distance above where he lay, a small, steady light. Francesca's heart began to quake. The light advanced toward him, and he perceived it was borne by a figure, arrayed in white from head to foot. Valea! cried he in amazement, mingled with superstitious terror as he recognized the features of his young fair mistress. Waste not time in words, said she. Much may yet be done, and I have the most perfect assurance that now, at least, I am not deceived. Up and be of good heart. Work, for here is light. I will sit down in the shelter, bleak though it be, of the cliff, and aid you with my prayers, since I cannot with my hands. Francesco seized the axe, and, stirred, half with shame, half with admiration, by the courage of the generous girl, resumed his labors with new vigor. Be of good heart, continued Lilia, and all will be well. Bravely, bravely done. Be sure the saints have heard us. Only once she uttered anything resembling a complaint. It is so cold, said she. Make haste, dearest, for I cannot find my way home, if I would, without the light. By and by she repeated more frequently the injunction to make haste. Francesco's heart bled while he thought of the sufferings of the sick and delicate girl on such a night, in such a place, and his blows fell desperately on the stubborn rock. He was now at a little distance from the spot where she sat, and was just about to beg her to bring the light nearer when she spoke again, Make haste, make haste, she said. The time is almost come. I shall be wanted. I am wanted. I can stay no longer. Farewell. Francesca looked up, but the light was already gone. It was so strange, this sudden desertion. If determined to go, why did she go alone, aware as she must have been that his remaining in the dark could be of no use? Could it be that her heart had changed the moment her hopes had vanished? It was a bitter and ungenerous thought, 
Nevertheless, it served to bridle the speed with which Francesco at first sprang forward to overtake his mistress. He had not gone far, however, when a sudden thrill arrested his progress. His heart ceased to beat. He grew faint, and would have fallen to the ground but for the support of a rock against which he staggered. When he recovered, he retraced his steps as accurately as it was possible to do in utter darkness. He knew not whether he found the exact spot on which Lilia had sat, but he was sure of the surrounding localities, and, if she was still there, her white dress would no doubt gleam even through the thick night which surrounded her. With a lightened heart, for, compared with the phantom of the mind which had presented itself, all things seemed endurable, he began again to descend the mountain. In a place so singularly wild, where the rocks were piled round in combinations at once fantastic and sublime, it was not wonderful that the light carried by his mistress should be wholly invisible to him, even had it been much nearer than it was by this time probable. Far less was it surprising that the shouts, which ever and anon he uttered, should not reach her, for he was on the lee side of the storm, which raved among the cliffs with a fury that might have drowned the thunder. Even to the practiced feet of Francesco, the route, without the smallest light to guide his steps, was dangerous in the extreme, and to the occupation thus afforded to his thoughts it was, perhaps, owing that he reached Nicolai's house in a state of mind to enable him to acquit himself in a manner not derogatory to the dignity of manhood. Nicoli, said he, on entering the room, I have come to return you thanks for the trial you have allowed me. I have failed, and, in terms of the engagement between us, I relinquish my claims to your daughter's hand. He would have retired as suddenly as he had entered, but old Nicoli caught his arm. Bid us farewell, said he in a tremulous voice. Go not in anger. Forgive me for the harsh words I used when we last met. I have watched you, Francesco, from that day, and... He wiped away a tear as he looked upon the soiled and neglected apparel and the haggard and ghastly face of the young man. No matter. My word is plighted. Farewell. Now call my daughter, added he, and I pray God that the business of this night may end in no ill. Francesco lingered at the door. He would fain have seen but the start of Lilia's mantle before departing. She is not in her room, cried a voice of alarm. Francesco's heart quaked. Presently the whole house was astir. The sound of feet running here and there was heard, and agitated voices calling out her name. The next moment the old man rushed out of the room and, laying both his hands upon Francesco's shoulders, looked wildly in his face. Know you aught of my daughter, said he. Speak, I conjure you, in the name of the blessed Savior. Tell me that you have married her and I will forgive and bless you. Speak, will you not speak? A single word, where is my daughter? Where is my Lilia? My life, my light, my hope, my child? The Minerala started as if from a dream and looked around, apparently without comprehending what had passed. A strong shudder then shook his frame for an instant. Lights, said he, torches, every one of you follow me. And he rushed out into the night. He was speedily overtaken by the whole of the company, amounting to more than 12 men with lighted torches that flared like meteors in the storm. As for the leader himself, he seemed scarcely able to drag one limb after the other, and he staggered to and fro like one who is drunken with wine. They at length reached the place he sought, and by the light of the torches, something white was seen at the base of the cliff. It was Lilia. She leaned her back against the rock. One hand was pressed upon her heart, like a person who shrinks with cold, and in the other she held the lamp, the flame of which had expired in the socket. Francesco threw himself on his knees at one side and the old man at the other, while a light as strong as day was shed by the torches upon the spot. She was dead, dead, stone dead. After a time, the childless old man went to seek out the object of his daughter's love, but Francesco was never seen from that fatal night. 
A wailing sound is sometimes heard to this day upon the hills, and the peasants say that it is the voice of the Menerallo seeking his mistress among the rocks. And every dark and stormy night the lamp of Lelia is still seen upon the mountain as she lights her phantom lover in his search for gold. The best sentence in this story is, he had that deep and melancholy voice which, when once heard, lingers in the ear, and when heard again, however unexpectedly, seems like a longing realized. But this is really beautifully written, with lots of lovely sentences. Okay, so this is a sad story, but it's also a really sad story. Like, the monstrous unfairness of telling the poor man he can win the girl as long as he pays as much money as the rich man. The strange and terrible sense of honor they both have, that they accept the terms of this bargain and they stick to it, however hopeless and desperate it is. The increasing grimness and darkness of the story as we realize that they aren't going to make it, it's really sad. The story touches a few times on the limitations of a girl's life in these circumstances. She belongs to her father, who has the right to give her away, but the prudence to drive a hard bargain and give her at a good price. He says, did you notice, that men love and lasses like, and that's what it is for all time. And so, of course, she does what everyone does who feels powerless and is desperate to find a way to take control of a situation. She turns to religion and spirituality and mysticism. She's trying to influence the gods and the saints, trying to read her fate in the stars or in her dreams. And poor Francesco chases all over the mountain, digging wherever she tells him to. And the final blow is, of course, that they do win over the father, who wouldn't have minded so much if they'd just gotten married in spite of him. Good Lord! This story has rather mysterious origins. It appears in something called The Tale Book, second series, although I can't find the first series. It was published in 1835 by Baudry's European Library as part of their massive collection of ancient and modern British authors series of volumes. There's no editor, there's no preface, there's no explanation for how or why these stories were selected. The version that I have read, which I will link below, comes from the Harvard University Library. It was digitized by Google and then it was uploaded to the Internet Archive. This story is by Lee Ritchie and it is called The Storm Lights of Anzaska on the first page, but then it's also called Lilia's Lamp on the top of all of the other pages. And regardless, I can't find anything about this author or this story or any underlying legend anywhere. Of course, I might be searching in the wrong language. I feel like the mention in the author's footnote of the Austrian lira really pins down the time frame of this story. You may not have actually noticed this footnote on screen. It was back when we first introduced Lilia, and we're talking about her dowry. This story takes place in Piedmont on the Swiss border of Italy, far away from the Austrian border using the transportation methods of the time, in a deep valley between two branches of the Alps. But for a while, it was right on the border of the kingdom of Lombardy Venetia, a constituent land of the Austro Hungarian Empire. And that area used the Napoleonic Italian lira until 1822, and then the Austrian lira until, I think, Lombardy was ceded to France in 1859, somewhere around there. By the way, the history of Italy is super complicated, and I don't understand it at all. But my working theory in this instance is that since this book was published in 1835, the story must have been written between 1822 and 1835, probably closer to 1835, since the author felt that including a currency exchange rate would somehow be relevant. It's one oddly specific detail in an otherwise very vague context. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that although I really love how this story is written, and I'm happy to be in Italy for the first time on the channel, learning about the glaciers and the gold mines, I found this story almost too bleak. 
it's that weird thing of how hard life can be for people who try to do things the right way and play by the rules. It's like, yes, of course it's easier to get rich if you cheat on your taxes. And it's easier to get away with things if you just lie about them. And having a conscience is like a handicap. It makes everything more complicated and difficult. I think I'm also especially aware of these things right now because I'm an immigrant. It is harder as an immigrant to learn and understand and follow all the various rules that apply to you. Imagine trying to figure out taxes and, and employment law in a foreign language. And immigrants are also held to a higher standard of compliance. There are lots of resources to help people understand the relevant rules, but their effectiveness depends on your ability to ask the right questions, and you just don't know what you don't know. The couple in this story is like the tragic opposite polarity of Romeo and Juliet, right? That Italian couple decides to flaunt all the rules and norms and expectations in order to be together, and they unnecessarily suffer and die for it. And this Italian couple tries to make everyone happy and do what's asked of them, and they unnecessarily suffer and die over it. I guess the point is that some situations occasionally require rule breaking, but there can also be terrible consequences and you can't know which is which. The beauty of this story is matched only by its obscurity, which is why it's a great fit for this channel. Every week I scour weird old books to find strange, overlooked, and interesting stories to share with you. If you like that kind of thing, subscribe to the channel, like this video, and drop me a comment down below. Thanks for your support, and I will see you next week.